All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're up against Doug Leone and Ev Williams, so we thought it was just going to be our parents in the audience. But a couple of you have found your way out here, so thank you for putting your trust in us. I'm, I'm here with a fantastic founder in, in, in Adam Jackrood. So, Adam, over the next few days, this stage will be filled with founders and operators sharing their most important lessons and painful learnings about building technology companies. And personally, you've been building Spring Health for six and a half years now, and today it's a fantastic company, you know, valued at $2 billion, uh, more than 750 employees, and, and somewhere around 1,000 customers. So let's start with some context. Why is what we're discussing here today important? Like, why is it worth building a tech company? I think, um, I think for me it's important because it's, uh, there's two reasons. One is that you should always just follow your dream, right? And I think that founding your own company is the ultimate expression of, of following your dream. Uh, and then the second, for me personally as well, is that uh, founding a company, it's, it's a job or a career that really pushes you in every way, right? It's physically challenging, it's emotionally challenging, it's mentally challenging, it's, you know, it pushes you in every dimension. So if you're a person who likes to be pushed, then I think it's, a, it's an exciting path, right, regardless of the domain. That's a fantastic answer. So let's dive into the topic at hand, where we're kicking off this stage today discussing the foundational step that every company has to go through, right? Uh, putting together a founding team. Let's start with a very broad question, like which things are non-negotiable in, in great founding teams? We've, um, it, so it, the funny, the backstory around this is that uh, we actually met in Norway and we talked about this over breakfast, because uh, I, I had a very strong belief that the only thing that matters is trust. Um, and, and I honestly, I kind of lucked out. Uh, so I, when we founded Spring, there was three of us. Uh, we, we met as students at Yale. I was getting my PhD. And, and we, you know, it started with a cold email. It was one of those stories. And so I really lucked out because in hindsight, when I look back, that was an extremely irresponsible decision. And, uh, and now I believe strongly that the only thing that matters is trust. And you know, Miko and lots and lots of other people will, were saying at the time, look, the, you know, it's really important that you have a balance, someone who understands sales, someone who understands technology, that kind of stuff. And, and I think um, I still stand by my answer. You know, many people say that you need balance. I think balance is okay, but I think that trust is really the most important thing. All right, so it's all, all about trust. Yes, hand to that. Uh, all right, so you already referred to the fact that you were three people when you, when you found Spring, yourself, your CEO uh, to this day, April, and then your technical co-founder, Abhishek, and you, you uh, alluded to the fact that you met at Yale, and it started with a cold email. But can you describe that process in a bit more detail? And specifically, can you touch on, like, how did the three of you become convinced that, like, we're going to go on this crazy ride together? Yeah, the, the, I mean, the interesting thing about founding a company is that at the beginning, there's really no risk, right? The, you, there's nothing at stake. There's no customers. There's no product. There's no team. There's no employees. There's no, you know, investment. And so in the early days, it's actually a very simple decision because you can unwind that commitment with, you know, it's an equally, you know, trivial statement to say that you're going to found a company and equally trivial to unwind it because almost no consequences. And so, you know, in the early days, I think it, it, it didn't really feel like a huge decision. Um, we, had, we met, you know, we, we converged around this idea you know, I was getting my PhD on, on treatment selection algorithms and, and basically developing machine learning tools that would help us make better decisions in psychiatry. Uh, and, you know, and, and we all had this, you know, this, uh, this passion and this excitement to, to bring this kind of technology to patients, right? And so, you know, in academia, you kind of you know, incentivize to keep on publishing papers and, and industry for us was a, a faster way of bringing that technology to market. And so we converged around that idea and that excitement. But at the beginning, it was, it's a pretty trivial statement to say, OK, well, let's make it a company. OK, fine. Yeah, obviously, it ultimately becomes very important, right, once the company grows big. So like, I don't know, looking back, if you were to found again, would you have like, gone through a deeper <laughs> due diligence process? I, yeah, I, yeah, it's one of those things where the, you know, the frog is boiling in water, and they never jump out if, they st if it starts cold. Right? The, 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 the consequences really grow and snowball in the background. I, again, you never say, there's never a day where you say, OK, it's a $2 billion company. We're going to have a thousand employees and five million patients. That you know that day doesn't just emerge, and so these things kind of creep up on you, and, and you realize over time that the consequences are big. Um, I think the naivety really helps, though, right? <laughs> like when you found a company, you say, "Okay, we're going to found it," and you have no idea how much work it's going to be, how much stress it's going to be, the emotions, you know, the uh, the, the strain it's going to take. And so I think that the naivety kind of helps. You just say, oh, "I want to found a company," and you just do it, and and you live with the consequences, and you get better at managing it. All right. 
And it sounds like you know, Spring's founding team is, is pretty much uh, a textbook example of how you should found your co find your co-founder. So like, you know, three people find each other at university serendipitously because they have this shared passion for a problem, which is a big problem shared by many people, and they happen to bring in sort of complementary skills. Um, like you had a deep understanding of the problem space, and maybe some of the solution space as well. Uh, April had a drive to basically just go out and build a generational tech company, and then Abhishek, I think you described him as the most talented um, uh, technical person you had, you had ever met. Um, however, not all people stumble across potential co-founders that complement them. Many people's networks are pretty homogenous. So which one is more important, finding with people you know and sort of trust from before, or with someone who, with whom you have like perfectly complementary skills? It's definitely trust. I don't know whether you would trust them beforehand, right? I think trust is something that builds over time and is definitely earned. Um, and so I would say that either it's someone that you do already deeply trust and think that you can, you know, ride out the next 10 years with them, or it's someone where you both are committed to building that trust, I think is the most important. The skill set, look, it matters in the first one year, maybe, the first six months, maybe, but as soon as you've managed to raise any money, as soon as you start hiring people, you can hire people to cover the gaps. So if if no one knows how to code, hire someone who knows how to code. If no one understands FP&A, hire someone who understands FP&A. Um, for every kind of, kind of skill set, you'll be able to hire people who, who are way better than any of these founders at that, um, at that specific vertical or that specific role. And so I don't worry too much about skill set. I worry a lot about trust and whether, e whether all of the founders are equally committed hmm. and are, are on the same page about what this is going to take and how long you're willing to dedicate and, and what your exit criteria are going to be. Yeah. I'll still push you on a bit on that point. Can you describe sort of your own skill set and you as a, as a human being, can you describe which things in, in April or RB sort of were not necessarily sort of vital, but certainly important in, in complementing how you are? Like, like yeah. which skill sets needed to be there? Yeah, the, um, well, I I again, though, this, this is a great example. So, you know, in the, in the history books, it's going to say Adam is the domain guy. He understood psychiatry. In practice, I basically ran sales and, and spent most of my time with customers. And so it's like, okay, well, if you wanted to hire an ideal first sales rep, you're probably not going to go and find a guy with a PhD in machine learning. So it's like already the domain thing is kind of challenged. I would say that each, uh, the, the most important thing that you're going to bring is commitment, right? Mm -hmm. It's that you're actually going to be dedicated to trying to solve this problem and that you're willing to ride out the pain, I would say. I think in April's case, you know, that she she is the, the 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 battery pack for Spring Health. Like she brings energy to everything, and she, I, you know, I've never met anyone that has that same drive, that persist, that persistence, that focus, that dedication, and, and you know, she she has bigger batteries than anyone you will ever meet. And so I think that there are, you know, there are elements of that. I think. She's also very optimistic. Mm -hmm. Both of us are highly critical, but also optimistic. And I think that's an interesting balance that is pretty helpful um, for so at least someone on the founding team should be able to, to criticize and to, uh, you know, to, to really evaluate and analyze what you're doing. But you have to be optimistic because there's a million reasons why this is not going to work out. So if, you know, you, you'll feel smart by identifying the reasons why it's not going to work out, but you do have to do something about it. And I think that, you know, some combination of trust, dedication, and optimism, I think, is really the only, the only criteria that I would look for in a, in a founder or if, if I was evaluating a founding team. Sure. Um, well, so far in this discussion, we've assumed that every company has a founding team, but that's you know, obviously not true, I think, out of sort of one Y Combinator's matches, 10% of companies tend to be solo founded. And there are some fantastic success stories uh, that have been built by solo founders. So in general, would you advise the audience like against founding alone? Or can there be some people or situations in which, in, in which that actually makes sense? I mean, there's definitely cases where it makes sense, right? I think the history books have shown. Um, I, I could never do it. I don't know how they can do it. I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a crazy ask. The, the thing that, that worked really well about, about me in April, particularly over the years, is that when you have a co-founder that's equally dedicated and equally in it, you're, you're writing these ups and downs, right? The ups and downs at the beginning are you know, they're relatively minor, and they maybe change once, at, once every day or once every week. And then as, as the company grows, the ups and downs get bigger and bigger. The wins get crazy, the losses get crazy, and, and the time between the two of them really narrows. And so it's very helpful amongst the founding team just to balance that emotional load so that you're not both, you know, if there's two of you, it's rare that both of you are hyper negative on one day. And so it's helpful to have a little bit of balance between the two of you. So if there's a day where I'm really, you know, frustrated because something has happened and I, you know, I want X and I didn't get Y, 
or, or you know, there's a day when the same thing happens with April, I think that, that buffering is really helpful because you know, if it's just you on your own, you, know, you can be in, you can have a, a, a run of losses or a run of wins that can kind of tilt you and, and you would start behaving irrationally, right? You either start to believe your own hype if things keep going well, or you start to believe that you're dying when you're not dying, and this is just what it looks like. And so a, a bit of balance is very helpful. Yeah. Absolutely. We did talk a little bit about skills in, in, in founding teams. And I think a specific skill gap, and something that I asked you about the uh, trip to Norway that you mentioned, is a technical co-founder. Like, there's a lot of people who want to build companies but aren't themselves technical, or aren't sufficiently technical for the problem space in, in, in question. So there's like a bunch of people going around saying, like, I want to found a company, but I don't have a technical co-founder. Yeah. How would you advise them to think about that? Like, is a technical co-founder always necessary? And if so, like, how should you find them when you don't know anyone who can code that well? Yeah. I, I, um, I think that you have to be extraordinarily critical of your own company. What company are you really, really building, right? If it's another vertical SaaS company, mm -hmm. you probably don't need a technical co-founder. You really don't. Like, if it's some blue sky problem, it's really never been done before, extraordinarily complicated hardware or software technology, maybe. But if it's another hardware SaaS, com you know, another vertical SaaS company that's hosted in the cloud and it does some CRUD stuff, then you don't really need a technical co-founder, right? That's the kind of skill gap that you can hire for down the line. You'll be able to find much more senior people, much more experienced people, you know, people who have been through the ringer many times. And so I think that, you know, for me, I think you have to be very critical of whether you really need a, a technical co-founder. These days, if I was going to build a second company, I would do it all on pre-sales. I would build prototypes in Figma or InVision, and I would forward sell on the prototypes. I wouldn't even touch a line of code. I think we spent the first two years of spring writing code that ended up being rewritten maybe six months down the line anyways. And so it's, you know, I don't know how helpful, we had a technical co-founder, and yet still we spent two years building something that we didn't sell, and then six months later we spent a year rebuilding it once we had sold it. So it's like, was that useful? Probably not. And so I, don't, I, I think there are cases where a technical co-founder is necessary. I think that most people, you know, for, for another, yet another B2B SaaS company, I don't think you need one. Interesting. So if I was, um... I mean, let's pretend I'm not technical, actually. Let's not pretend I'm not technical. If I was to found like a, an HR tech company, like I'll go after Workday, what you'd advising me to do is uh, to go out, draw a product in Figma, and actually start selling the product Definitely. with just that view. Definitely. Okay. Sell it. Go out, see if you can convince someone to buy it from you. And All that's right. the ultimate test of whether you should do it, because it's very easy to build something. It's very easy to find technical co-founders. You can go and work with outsource agencies. You can build whatever you want. There's no, there's no like fundamental barrier, but you're also not de-risking anything because you're just building the thing. You haven't sold it. Uh, ultimately, your company is only real if you have revenue. The only way to get revenue is by selling, not by building. Not by, it's a, a, a simple thing to get wrong, but you actually don't need the product to sell it. You need customers to, to justify building it. And so it's an interesting, I, I think it's a mistake that we made, don't get me wrong. We spent <laughs> two years building something that barely anyone used. That was a mistake, that was wasteful, but um, yeah, and that, again, is not to say that to build the next workday. I think to build the next workday, you have to have a, an incredibly technical company. You have to make a lot of really good architecture decisions, without a doubt. But I don't think that you need a, a technical co-founder to do that. I think you need to hire a lot of really good engineers. Interesting. All right, let's switch gears and let's talk about uh, roles in, in founding teams, because that's obviously another decision you have to make. It's like, what am I going to work on? What are you going to work on? And I guess in your case, in the, in the early days of spring, it was kind of pretty clear that Abby was going to be CTO. But you and April yeah. like, had a sufficient overlap where you probably need to make a very intentional decision yeah. about what, what you're going to focus on. And you mentioned like, you focused on sales, even if you had this like, deep understanding of the problem space, which probably yeah. would have allowed you to do other things. So, like, um, so how did you choose your early roles, and why and like why and how have you kind of adapted them since? Yeah. So um, this is a tricky one, and I, and I don't know how representative our, our case is for what other companies would experience. But so uh, you know, April and I uh, have have had highly interchangeable roles throughout the history of Spring. You know, in the early days, you know, I came out of grad school with my PhD, designed the original version of the product. You know, talked about how it would work. You know, we put together the first version of the product. And then when we needed to sell it, I was the natural person to sell it because it was kind of my idea. And so I was just explaining how it works and how it could solve you know, these enterprise uh, mental health problems. And, and it didn't really feel like sales. It felt like I was just explaining it. But then I was the natural first sales rep. And then you know, if I'm the first sales rep, it makes sense for me to train the next ones. It makes sense for me to hire them out. And then so I ended up running sales for a pretty long time. 
Then we got to a point where there are just people who are better at running sales, and so we hired that person, and I moved back over into product. And while I was running sales, April was running products, and then we switched back, and now April runs products and engineering, and I'm just doing sales. And so the whole time, we've been very flexible in, in, in changing those roles, and it's interesting, you know, because it doesn't, it, actually, it really emphasizes that your initial skill set is kind of irrelevant for where the company is gonna go. And the needs of the company also emerge and, and evolve over time quite considerably. And so I think you have to stay flexible to that. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to be open about what you're good at and what you're bad at. You have to be willing to change that and put in the work you know, to, to grow in areas where you're weak, and, and, and that might take sustained effort. And you have to be willing to, you know, there's that amazing article about give up your Legos, right? You have to be willing to give up your Legos. At certain points, there are people out there in the world who are gonna be way better at that job than you were, even if it's your baby and even if it was your idea. And so you have to be willing to bring those people in for the, for the good of the company. So I think that, um, you know, in, even in the early days, I think the, it, it's, it, it's so variable and it's, it, it can, people can play different roles. As long as they have low ego, as long as they stay humble, as long as they have that growth mindset and they, they know that they don't know everything and that they have to learn things, I think that as long as everyone stays flexible, then the, the changing roles over time it, it was not a big deal for us. Mm -hmm. April's very low ego though, so I, I don't know if it, it, maybe other companies find it harder, but in our case it was pretty easy. And a specific role that most companies are going to have to decide on pretty early on, or some founding teams do try and push it back, is like, who's going to be CEO? And, and like, statistically, in most companies, the person who's CEO initially is going to be CEO for like a very long time. And obviously the CEO role, while like sort of immaterial in the early days, eventually you become the face of the company, you probably have more influence and so on. So how do you make that decision? Isn't that like super hard to decide who's going to be like the, the front person? Yeah, I, I mean, again, in the early days, there's like nothing at stake. And so for us, it was like a two minute conversation. April wanted to do it. She'd already founded a company before. She'd sold it to Fox. She'd come back. She wanted to found a new company. You know, I was still getting my PhD. I hadn't dropped out. I was still, you know, wrapping up my PhD. April said she wanted to be CEO. I was like, all right, sounds good. That okay. was really how long the conversation lasted. It didn't last much longer. And I think, it, again, why did that work? I think it worked because she wasn't in it for the ego. It was an expression of how committed she was to the company and that she was really dedicated to spend the next 10, 15, maybe 20 years on this problem. And so I think, you know, that's how it worked out. But I've seen a lot of people, they do stuff like co-CEO and all that kind of stuff. I think, I think it kind of points to maybe some like e either ego issues that are going on or unresolved tensions in, in the company. It's like, okay, you have two CEOs, nah, okay, you know probably you should resolve that and you should have one CEO. Yeah, so, yeah. it's loud and clear. All right, let's, uh, let's hit off one very practical question, which is you know, one more decision that you're gonna have to make is how much equity is each founder going to get? So yeah. would you always advise founders to go for an equal equity split or would you sometimes in kind of some circumstances split equity unequally? Um, I think th there's always nuance. I think that you should just split equally. You should have a one-year cliff and you should have a four-year vest. I think that there's always nuance and like there are certainly gonna be cases where you might wanna vary things. If someone started working on it long before the rest of the team joined, maybe you can talk about backdating the vest to the point where that person had started. If one person joins late, maybe the other person starts vesting beforehand. But ultimately, like imbalances amongst co-founders um, in terms of the cap table, I think it can it can, again, it can, it can erode trust, right? And I think it erodes trust because one person is like literally not as bought in as the other person. And so it, then you'll start to wonder like, is this person less bought in than me? Is this person less committed? Are they putting in a certain percentage less work, less time, less emotional investment? And you know, maybe they are because they are literally incentivized less than you. So I think anything that can erode trust over time, I think is, a, is not worth it. I think for me, I would always split it, keep it clean, and, and keep it equal. If you, you know, especially because you know when you go into these situations, if you say that you're co-founding a company together, but one person deserves more equity, again, I think it speaks to like a, a, a thing that's going to blow up in the future. Does one person really think they're worth more than the other person? Why should one person, you know, unless they brought in a lot of angel investing, unless one person has funded the company, which again is different, I think ultimately your co-founders should be equal. All right. But well, then let's talk about decision making within the founding team. So, you know, these days I, I doubt you and able, uh, April are able to like make every single decision together. You probably don't even strive to do that. But in the early days, you conceivably could. Like the complexity of the company is so small that you could be involved in every single decision. Should you do that? 
for like buy-in and cohesion, or should you move into like independent decision making within the roles you've decided on? We kept it together for a really long time. I think for as long as you can fit all the people in a room, I mean, look, it's a little bit different now with remote work, but I think for as long as everyone's in the same room or if everyone's working together, I think the, 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 as to, to the extent that you can reduce communication overhead and reduce communication barriers, you should just do that. And I think that it was nice in the early days. We were always in the same room. You always knew what was going on on everything. You would always have input into the decision. Doesn't mean that you have to make every decision together. Doesn't mean that you have to agree on every single thing. But I think that it was helpful. And definitely, especially amongst an early core team, I would say don't even make it just about the founders making the early decisions. Get your early employees in as well, because the, uh, the more you can spread that context, the better, right? Like it, your first 10 people are gonna hire your first 30 people. Your first 30 people are gonna hire the first 50 people, and the first 50 people are gonna lock in culture for basically the next 1,000 people. And so it's really important that those first 10 people do do a good job of understanding the business and hiring the next 10, that those first 20 do a good job of understanding the business and hiring the next 50, because those 50 are incredibly influential down the line. And so, yeah, I think for, um, you, you, eventually you split, right? There's only so many places you can be. <laughs> I know April is in Vegas right now. I know what she's doing. She knows I'm here. You know, at some point, you have to just trust each other and, and go and do stuff. But, um, but, but yeah, I would say for as long as possible, I wouldn't shy away from having too many cooks in the kitchen. All right. Now, Spring's founding team is kind of famously diverse. I mean, already talked about how it's diverse in, in, in skill sets, like a founding team should be, but then it's also diverse in a bunch of like demographical factors. Um, and, and what I want to ask you about is like, to what extent is kind of co-founder diversity, whether in skill set, in mindset, in attitude, in perspective, like to what extent is a good thing? And in what areas do you have to be aligned? In what areas do you have to be like carbon copies of each other? Yeah, it's, um, it is important, right? I think it is really important. Mm -hmm. I think that, that uh, the process of founding a company is just de-risking a bunch of things. Like you have this conviction that companies should give out free mental health care to people and their, their, to their employees and to their family members who work there. Like you have conviction in this statement and the whole point of founding a company is to continually de-risk that statement, right? And so um, it's, it's important, right? I would say diversity helps you accomplish that because there will be blind spots and there'll be things that you can each, um, you, can, you can spread the load. I, I, think, I think the thing that you have to be crystal clear on is, on is trust, and I think is also this kind of this growth mindset you have to be incredibly clear on. And I think we didn't do this conversation in hindsight, but I kind of wish we did. I think you have to be crystal clear on what are your exit criteria. I think you have to agree upfront, like this is how long I'm gonna work on it. If this happens, I'm gonna keep working on it, and if this happens, we're gonna fold. And, and until that exit criteria has been met, you don't quit. Because there's gonna be a million times where you wanna quit. Almost every day, you'll have a pretty good reason to quit, without a doubt. And so, you, but you have to say, like, this is the line in the sand that we're gonna draw, and until we reach that line, we don't quit. All of your customers can churn, that might not be the line. For me, that wasn't the line. Actually, losing a, you know, a seven-figure deal is not the line for me at all. For me, the day, is, the day that I quit is the day that April breaks trust. If I don't trust April anymore, I'm out. And I'm sure that she'll probably give you a pretty sim similar answer, you know, on, um, on the inverse, so I think that you know the thing that you have to be, you have to be aligned on, is at what point will you quit, and that you're not going to quit up until that point. Let's dive a bit deeper there. Like, are there other questions that should be asked in that conversation? Like, if I wanted to found a company with you now, and I don't know you very well from before, yeah. like, what is the list of questions I should ask you on like yeah. day zero, and make sure you give like yeah. a certain answer before I trust that this is going to yeah. work out? Why do you want to found a company? Yeah. What's the goal? Do you want to get rich? Do you want to be famous? Do you want to hire a lot of people? Do you want to be powerful? Do you want to, are you obsessed with building this thing, whatever the thing is that you want to build? Is it because you're excited by the, the problem? Is it intellectually challenging? I would need to really understand your motivation for founding the company. Again, in hindsight, this is all stuff that I'm saying now that we never did, right? We were just like, all right, let's do it. And we just started doing it and see what happens, which don't do that, by the way. But. Um, but yeah, I would, I would really need to understand your motivation. And then again, what, when will you quit? Because it's so easy to quit. And the <laughs> number one reason why companies ultimately die is because of founders either fighting or quitting, right? And so to the extent that you can remove as much risk as possible from a founder quitting or a founder fighting each other, then I think that 
that's probably the most helpful thing you can do to de-risk the company's long-term success. So yeah, really try and understand their motivation, understand them as a person, understand where they came from, understand where they want to get to, understand why they're doing this. And if you think that you're compatible, you don't have to agree, by the way. Mm -hmm. You just have to be compatible. And you just have to understand each other. OK, I think we have two minutes left. Let's try and clear two questions. So first of all, we talked about like the early days of the founding team. But obviously, when a company becomes as big as Spring is today, yeah. like your, your, your sort of co-founder relationship evolves, and you have to sort of nurture it. So, so I'm curious to hear, like, how has yours and April's relationship evolved? Yeah. And, and what habits have you found for like keeping it together to a sufficient extent? <laughs> yeah. Uh, April's now my longest relationship. We're, we're not dating at all, but the, um, it, you really should think of it like a marriage. You, it, it is a marriage. No matter whatever people say, it is literally a marriage. Many founders go through counseling together in the same way that you would if you were, if you were married. I would totally recommend that for people, regardless of whether the relationship is good or bad, or you think it might be good in the future or bad in the future, you should always consider investing in that. Um, so it, it's really a relationship. It grows. It changes a lot over time. Like now, I understand April in a way deeper way than I used to. In the early days, we would scream at each other all the time, walk out of the room. Like it, you know, it was crazy. It was crazy. And you know, you learn over time. Okay, this is you know, this is how what makes her happy. This is what makes her sad. If I say this, she's going to be you know, this is going to rub her the wrong way. She knows the exact same thing about me. And so you learn a lot of balance in the relationship. But you have to invest in it. You have to work on it. You have to work on, on your professional relationship. You have to work on being friends. You have to work on really investing and in understanding that person so that you, it's important not just because of the, this is the person that I've spent the most time in my life with. You will spend more time with that person than anyone else in your life. And so you should probably be open to that. And you should, you should probably make that as pleasant as possible. And it's also important professionally as well, because I think the, the stronger the bond that the founders have, the better you know, longevity you'll have as a company. OK, and very quickly, let's end on a high, high note. What's your favorite memory of you and April working together on Sprint? <laughs> 20 seconds. 20 seconds. It was uh, probably like 20, 2016, 2017. Uh, we were in South Park in San Francisco, which is a little, uh, a little area where all of the VCs are. And We'd probably just been rejected by like 20 people as usual. And it was a beautiful day. We'd finished. We were about to get a taxi back to the airport. April was like laying in this children's playground. And she's like rolling on the floor. And she's like, do you want to just take some selfies? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> We'd taken an absolute pounding all day, all these VCs with a million reasons to say no. And they'd all said no. And we were like, all right, whatever. And we were going to go home. And I think it was, that's, that's a great example. In my head at the point, I was pretty pissed off, you know? I'm sitting there thinking, these VCs don't get it. I hate this. This sucks. And she was, you know, she was just in a different phase at that point. And, it, and we got through it. Wonderful. All right. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, everyone who came out to listen to us. Hope you learned something.